Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go subscribe there, get your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great review uh, if you're out in practice as well as if you're uh, going through pharmacology courses, uh, preparing for board exams. Uh, nice little quick refresher of some of the most important uh, testable pearls as well as some of uh, those things that you commonly see in clinical practice. So again, reallifepharmacology.com uh, is where you can find that by subscribing. All right, so let's talk about the drug of the day today, and that is trospium chloride. I'll just refer, it, refer to it as trospium today. Uh, brand name of this medication is Sanctura. And technically, it's classification. Uh, it is a bladder anticholinergic or bladder anti-muscarinic, whichever terminology uh, you kind of prefer there. It, it generally fits. Uh, ultimately, what this does is it blocks the action of acetylcholine in bladder smooth muscle. And what that ends up doing or what this medication is commonly used for is um, urinary frequency and, and overactive bladder type symptoms. Uh, dosing with this medication, we're going to look at twice a day, usually for the immediate release. Uh, there is an extended release version as well. Uh, generally, this is going to uh, cost more money, um, unfortunately. Uh, however, you know, I, I definitely have seen uh, both utilized from time to time in clinical practice. Now, adverse effect profile, as you could imagine, with a medication that's classified as a bladder anticholinergic, you are going to have anticholinergic adverse effects. Dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, constipation, uh, the potential for urinary retention, uh, if we get too much of the drug there, obviously, uh, can slow the GI tract down. And then CNS uh, sedation, uh, potentially increasing falls risk and things of, of that nature. Uh, however, um, I will mention with Trosprium and in clinical practice, one of the reasons that you might want to consider Trosprium over some of the older bladder anticholinergics such as oxybutynin or tolteridine is it has potential for less CNS penetration, so less ability to get across that blood-brain barrier. And with that being said, obviously, we're hoping for less uh, CNS, central nervous system, adverse effects. So that CNS depression, um, maybe that fall risk, uh, that might be slightly lower with Trosprium versus, again, some of those older anticholinergics often used for uh, bladder spasms and, and overactive bladder. Uh, the flip side uh, of this is that um, cost is, is generally more uh, with this medication, at least at this time. Um, so that's a, a potential downside to Trosprium and why you probably don't see it as much as you see oxybutynin and tolteridine is because of insurance coverage and costs that way. Uh, this medication is on the beers list. So uh, whenever I see this medication used, I'm always looking for some of those trigger medications that indicate to me anticholinergic adverse effects. Uh, whether it's uh, saliva substitutes, whether it's an increase in uh, you know BPH medications such as Tamsulosin, um, but you know, often urology will uh, use these medications together. Um, so that's, that's kind of something that's a, a specialized thing. Um, but it does have the potential to worsen that urinary retention. Uh, so artificial tears, if you see a drug um, uh, for constipation, there's another potential adverse effect from trospium. Uh, if you see a drug like uh, metoclopramide or erythromycin used to uh, stimulate motility of the gut, so we're thinking gastroparesis there, well, trospium can do the opposite and potentially 
oppose the beneficial effects of those prokinetic uh, type agents there. All right, let's talk kinetics a little bit. Um, first off, I want to mention SIP pathways, and the reason I want to mention that is because trospium generally isn't metabolized by those SIP pathways, or at least not to a significant extent. So that is definitely awesome when it comes to uh, potential drug interactions and things like that. Uh, administration uh, and absorption. So ideally, it's best to administer on an empty stomach. Um, that is due uh, to food's ability to kind of blunt or block absorption of the drug a little bit. Again, if it's so, this is something in, in clinical practice where uh, if the patient's tolerating it, they're benefiting from it, and they're taking it with breakfast every morning and they're doing it consistently and, and they feel the drug is working great, it's like I'm probably not going to switch that. So it's probably not a major, major deal. Um, but if the patient is not responding to the medication and they're taking it with breakfast or you know lunch or whatever time of the day they're taking it, that's the situation where I'm going to go in and I'm going to recommend, hey, let's take this you know maybe an hour or two before we eat on an empty stomach and we might help maximize that absorption and obviously that can help the drug work better uh, if we're getting potentially higher uh, target therapeutic concentrations uh, to that patient. So uh, that's kind of how I think about um, something like this with, with administration uh, and just kind of navigating that with patients and um, trying to encourage them to uh, take it at the best time, uh, particularly if they're not responding uh, to therapy. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCMTMS, BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, uh, psychiatric certification, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. In addition, if you're a pharmacy student, we've got NAPLEX content there as well. So go check that out, support the sponsor. Uh, if you're a nurse practitioner, med student, physician, uh, just looking to brush up on case studies, clinical pearls, looking for great resources that way. Um, I have books, uh, numerous books on Amazon, uh, numerous books on Audible as well um, to kind of help lay out case scenarios, clinical situations, um, stopping polypharmacy, drug interactions, uh, all sorts of, of good stuff to help uh, teach and to help you learn medication management uh, better if that's a, a weak area uh, within your practice. So again, all those resources, links, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so let's finish up with drug interactions. So, you know, I mentioned that trospium doesn't really go through those SIP pathways, so that's super nice as far as reducing the risk for drug interactions. Um, most of the drug interactions I think of when I think of, of trospium are going to be some of those additive effects. And particularly, you know, trospium being on the beers list, um, some of those drugs that you shouldn't use in, in elderly patients or ideally avoid in elderly patients. Um, I think of anticholinergic bur burden first and foremost. So if we're using trospium with other agents that have anticholinergic activity, uh, your diphenhydramines, your hydroxyzines, and so on and so forth, um, we're going to increase the risk of those anticholinergic adverse effects. Your dry eyes, your dry mouth, um, potentially sedation, fall risk, things like that. Um, remember I mentioned trospium is hopefully lower risk when it comes to some of those CNS adverse effects, um, but certainly uh, that additive effect uh, can still happen. Uh, and then in addition to, you know, those anticholinergic effects, uh, we've got to think about the potential for uh, mild sedative properties and CNS depression. So, you know, your benzodiazepines, your sleeper medications, your opioids, uh, alcohol, that may have a potential uh, additive effect, additive CNS depressant type effect when combined with trospium. All right, so I've definitely talked about anticholinergic effects 
um, and really highlighted those. Uh, if you go back to the oxybutynin um, pharmacology podcast, uh, so you'll definitely uh, hear me talk about some of the prescribing cascade and particularly the specific anticholinergic side effects a little bit more there. Uh, so that's a good one probably to, to head back and, and brush up on. Diphenhydramine is probably another example uh, where I've, I've talked about those adverse effects. So I'm going to wrap up the podcast for today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, if you enjoyed this podcast, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Um, email your, you know, class that's taking pharmacology, share us with, uh, friends, colleagues, and, and other classmates. If you're in school, uh, that's greatly appreciated and has certainly helped our, our podcast grow, um, to, uh, heights that I, that I never would have, uh, uh thought, uh, that it could. So I'm, I'm greatly appreciative to all of you who have done that. And if you haven't taken the time, um, definitely, uh, feel free to share us with, uh, all your uh, healthcare colleagues and, and classmates. So uh, with that said, I'm going to sign off. Uh, you can track me down, mededucation101 at gmail.com uh, or LinkedIn is probably the social media network I'm most active on and easy, uh, easiest to get a response from there. So uh, take care and I hope you have a great rest of your day.